uh, session begins with uh, uh, just a little, this is, this is what you're going to see on the screen now. This is what today is about. You still remember? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, he gave us, in the middle of my talk a year ago, he got up here and we were talking about affirmations. I said, anybody out there have an affirmation about this business or their life or anything? So I'd like, uh, like you to do that. Sure, like, wake sure. us up this morning. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I know the biggest thing before I get started, what hit me last year about uh, Mr. Meyer's speech was that he said, there's no dogma, science, creed, or religion that are attracting your life, but your thoughts will repel. And your thoughts will repel anything that you cannot see, visualize, or put down in black and white. And uh, that hit me so hard that I remember it, exactly how it said. If you listen to the tape, that's exactly how he said it. And uh, I know for me, when they put down that million dollar formula about what it takes to get there, um, I actually have to go back, look at my affirmations and say, wow, okay, I need to make some adjustments because I know that uh, maybe some people in the field could relate that I was at the position I wanted to be, but I wasn't at the income I wanted to have. And it was because I didn't really see how to get that income. And so I'm going to share with you my affirmations from last year moving into this year. So I'm excited about my new ones. but. Uh, here we go. Slorin Scared uh, calling in with his affirmations. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I wake up every single day without giving any mental recognition to the possibility of defeat. I'm son of a king. I create higher vibrations for me and for others so I can heighten their security and, uh, and raise their level. I'm son of a king. I love myself. I respect myself. I create higher vibrations of discipline that strengthens my mind and releases my energy. I move from, I've journeyed from ego to spirit. I am a platinum executive director. I'm a six figure ring earner. I am a millionaire. I am the youngest millionaire in prepaid legal services and responsible for having the youngest millionaires in prepaid legal. I give because I own nothing. I love because love is God. I am wise because I am as wise as Solomon. This is who I am. This is what I am. They call me LG, platinum child, platinum. <laughs> Great job. Thanks. Okay, what is today about? Today's entire plan is about money. Making money, saving money, managing money, managing debt, achieving financial goals, and achieving financial independence. Let me just say something here before I start. I, I really am reluctant to talk about this today uh, because I'm uh, convincing and I'm very persuasive. And if they said I sell, so in one sense, you don't have the chance of a dying duck in a hailstorm of escaping the potency of what I say. Now, here's the danger in that. Uh, you could fall in love with this and get excited about it and get your values all messed up. So I just want to start out by telling you that uh, God is my number one priority. My wife, Jane, is my second priority. My kids are third. Uh, my physical fitness is fourth, and my business is fifth. So we're going to be talking all day about money, but I want to put it in the perspective where it is. Uh, everything is God's by right of creation. It's not mine. And so I only am interested in becoming immensely wealthy for, only for the express purpose of taking care of my family, but the preponderance <coughs> of it is, is to give it away. I'll be uh, 77 years old this week. Well, see, when I was 24, I was the highest paid insurance salesman in the United States, or made exactly $820,000. I don't know in today's dollars what that would be. So why have I worked my whole life? It's because I think God must have given me a gift, or when they handed out the talents, I guess I've got two or three sets of talents. And I, don't, and I never could figure out why it was and totally, completely till I was about 27. And that's when I made a commitment to not have Christ as the my Savior, but also to have him as the Lord of my life. So I wanted to give you that testimony first before I talk about money so I would have a clear conscience and tell you if, if you don't uh, give it away, it can consume you, it can dominate you, and it can wreck your life, and it can wreck your marriage, and it can wreck your kids, and it can wreck everything about you. So you need a lot of self-discipline if you're going to Take, if you're going to really do what I'm telling you to do today and suggesting you to do and, get, and sharing ideas with you to do today. So in that context, I'll proceed. Is that okay with all of you? 
But there's only, only two reasons anyone will do anything, to gain a benefit or avoid a loss. There aren't any other reasons. So I want to sell you on the benefits or list the benefits of why you should become finan financially successful. They're the things we need and must have. And you know what that is. That's clothes and food and, and water and, 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 uh, and a house over, over your head and so on. Security, peace of mind, money for homes and cars, things we like and want, money for education, retirement, money to give away. I could make this list 100 items, but you get the idea. Can anyone become financially independent? And the answer is a resounding yes. Well, you could interrupt me and say, hold it, hold it, hold it. I got a guy that cuts my grass and he makes $5.85 an hour. Can he become financially independent? You bet he can. I'll share it with you in just a minute. And then, and then well, well, my, and the, I'll just say this, that anyone that makes over $20,000 a year can be a millionaire. Now, if they can, it should be obvious that you can. What is financial success? And I've, I've written this out. I guess every decade I write it and write it again because you always can improve anything. Financial success is the ability to live the remainder of your life with outside help, working if you choose, but doing so only if you desire. That means you you got, the, but, but it's the ability to have things you want and need despite the occurrence other than the most catastrophic of outside circumstance. Now, those of you who have these huge incomes and residual income, there are several people in this room here that can quit today. They don't have to work again. But supposing, uh, uh, supposing uh, there's uh, some big bad thing that could happen to prepaid legal. I don't, I, I don't know what that could be. I'm just saying that nothing's for certain on this earth, all right? Uh, so other than that, you can become financially independent. Who is a typical millionaire? We always think it's those guys we read about in Forbes and Fortune and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, that's not true. That's not who the majority, the majority of the millionaires are the people uh, use common sense, are innovative, have their own businesses, are thrifty by nature. They live in your neighborhood and they're, uh, they're dressed uh, like we're dressed here today. In other words, they don't, they're not seven foot tall and they're not Hollywood good looking and they're not driving Rolls Royces. They're not everything that we would visualize. The difference between income and wealth, and I think this is significant, you need to get this straight. Uh, and is there a difference? There certainly is. Tens of thousands of people have incomes, but you wouldn't call them wealthy because of these reasons. They owe for their house, they owe for their car, they have little savings, uh, they have little paid for assets, the truth, the tr truth net, their true net worth, they fake it. They fake it on their financial statement to the bank, but their true net worth is only about half of what they claim it to be because it's got, everybody's got puff in it. On the other hand, wealth is people who have accumulated assets, cash, stocks, bonds, real estate, investments, and they have a residual income. Simply stated, they don't have to work, but they don't want to. Is there a magic formula? Yes, what is it? Well, it's the... It's different for everyone, and you can just create your own system. But all of, all of everything we're talking about today, uh, what I'm saying and what you're going to hear from a half a dozen CPAs and what you're going to share with them individually, and then the session I'm going to have at 2.30 this afternoon talking about how to make money or how to, how to put overalls on your money and put it to work, does require discipline, and it requires you accepting personal responsibility for your life, and it requires having a plan. Uh, yeah, those three things have to are a must, and I know I know people that have a plan, but they're not responsible. I know people that are responsible, that do not have a plan. I know people that have all of that, but they don't they don't ex they don't have any discipline, or they can't stick with it. I was in Columbus, Georgia, one time selling a man a savings insurance policy. He said he said, "Well, I don't need you, Paul Meyer." He said, "I save money." I said, "Oh, is that right?" And I said, "What do you have a you have a you put it someplace, an exact amount of your paycheck every week? He said, yeah. And I said, let me see it. Prove it to me. You got it? You got issue books? And back then, they had passbook savings plans. Let me see your passbook savings plan. Well, he couldn't take it out and show it to me. And I said, listen, the reason I'm in here is to protect you from yourself and all of your wants. And, and I said, what I want to do is package it, put it in an envelope, and send it. This, this guy's name was McDonald. 
I want to send it from the young McDonald to the old McDonald later on and keep your, keep your hands off of it in the meantime. And uh, I used to talk that brazen and that bold when I sold life insurance. You know, most guys that sell life insurance, you know, in case something happens, <laughs> I used to say, let me tell you something. You're going to be graveyard dead. They're going to put you six feet underground. They're going to have grass growing on top. They're going to put a stone on the head. Now, is there any part of that you don't understand? <laughs> and now that's, that's, that's with the guy's wife listening. And I said, did you hear what I just said about him? And I'll tell you what you don't know, miss. You don't know what day that's going to happen to him. And you got, you got three kids, and you got yourself, and you're young, and you, you married him so he'd take care of you? Well, let me just tell you something. These things can happen. You need to do business with me tonight. <laughs> well, see, that's, uh, that's pretty persuasive stuff. I just think all the other mealy mouth salesmen have been in there and say, and they're, they're wearing a tie and looking real professional and saying, you know, you know, in case something happens to you, you might want to, what kind of, you know, there's, there's no magic to stir men's blood. You've got to stir their blood if you want to sell them. You have to have passion. <laughs> I would like to add, if you make a good income and spend it all, you're not going to get wealthy. <laughs> now, now, isn't that, aren't I intelligent? <laughs> Doesn't that make me a genius to come up with that statement? <laughs> You're just going to live on a higher plane temporarily. Another way to say it is wealth is what you accumulate, not what you spend. I know a lot of people with a horrendous income, and they don't have any money in the bank. I mean, more than you can even imagine. Americans earn approximately $25 trillion a year. Can you imagine that figure? $25 trillion. 50% of all the wealth in America, though, is owned, listen to this real close, by 3.5% of the people. My father came here from Germany in 1920. They had a window of opportunity at that time, and they let in 20 million people. Those 20 million that came in from Europe, these are Italians and Greeks and Germans and uh, people from uh, Scotland, uh, Ireland, that group of people that came in now represent 175 million, or a li little over half of the United States. The population is from that 20 million. All right, they own 75% of everything in America. Now, they just got here, and, uh, and a lot of them are still alive. What how, how did they do it? How many came over from? 20 million. And that they're, they're now 175 million. In other words, I'm, I am the son of a German immigrant. And so that's where I, and that's, that's my father was my teacher, my mentor, my coach. Uh, my mother was, as everyone has told me, the most Christ-like person they ever met. So I had, I had that side. I ended up with one of those people with both sides of the brain. Meaning I, I, uh, my kids tell me they have a computer for a brain. And then at the same time, I can write uh, poetry or music or anything else on the other side and paint pictures. So that's, a, that's an unusual kind of mind, but I, I just happen to have those two kind of parents. And uh, so I consider that a, a gift. 3.5% of the people have most of the wealth. Now, those, of, those that are poor that are on welfare say the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's nonsense. Our family was one of the poorest families because my father just came over. We lived in a tent. We lived in a garage for 10 years. Uh, I didn't have my first piece of new clothing. I was 14 years old. But we were, we were rich because of the philosophy we had and the attitude that we had. And we learned some basic fundamentals and principles, and I'm going to share those with you uh, tomorrow. 25 million households in the United States earn over $50,000 a year. Seven million over a, own over a, over a hundred thousand, yet very few of these people have accumulated any wealth. To net it out, they live from paycheck to paycheck. Doesn't make any difference what they make. I've seen people start out with prepaid legal, and they came up with a job making eighteen thousand, and six months they're making thirty-six thousand, and another twelve months they're making a hundred. They're making seventy-five thousand, then they're making a hundred thousand, and I've seen them leave the business. 
because the wife says to the husband, you know, you're making all this money, everything's working. We still owe $18,000 on our credit cards. We're, this, we're, this thing's not working. You need to go back where, you, where we had a job and everything was paid for. You, you understand what I, you get what I just said? And it happened again and again and again and again. It happened to me when I was in life insurance business with the salesman I recruited. It happened with Word Records when I was with them. And it's happened with SMI and then the other companies that, that we have. And wherever people just do not have the discipline to understand the difference between wealth and income. Who becomes wealthy? Compulsive savers and investors. That's all. If you're not a compulsive saver and a compulsive investor, you will not be wealthy. They live, what is it? They live on less than they take in. They organize their time, energy, and money efficiently in ways con conducive to building wealth. They have a strong belief that gaining financial independence is far more important than displaying their temporary high status symbols. Now, you could say I'm picking on some of you that never had any money before and you went out and bought a Mercedes and you got a new home. I'm not talking about that. It's okay to do that. But I, I can name a professional. I won't, I won't use their name. I can name two professional football players that uh, I have talked to at the request of their friends to help them financially when they went into professional football. And they've got signing bonuses like uh, two million, four million, five million. Uh, they're making huge incomes. And uh, there is a good chance after all of that, and, and they're now, I won't tell you what age they are, but there's a good chance that they may not have enough income to last for their lifetime. They're gonna have to go out and get a job and learn how to do something. I mean, I think that's a, that's a, a travesty of justice. That's a tragedy itself. That's an indictment to the, to the NFL, in my opinion, and to whoever their managers are. It's a terrible thing. And the, the first thing I put down when I, when I talked to them is, it was a principle we live by, nothing's forever, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And, and the other one is you don't have, to, you don't have to, to gamble the same, you don't have to bet the same on the, after you have the first million, you don't have to say, take the same chance to make the second million. You know, your, your risk thing can come down as you make that money. When you start out, you might as well risk it all. You don't have anything. But that risk scale should slide back at each, each million you make. Their parents did not keep on and keep on helping them financially. Now, if you want to become independently wealthy, you better figure a way to, uh, to, to cut them off scholarship and let them and pull that umbilical, financial umbilical cord out and let them run. And they're going to make mistakes, let them make mistakes. Their children over age 21 are, <laughs> their children over age 20, 21 are economically self-sufficient. What does that mean? You have taught them to accept personal responsibility for their life. They know how to make decisions. They know how to set goals. Uh, all, all of what it takes to function in today's world. They have a keen insight to recognize a great opportunity. And you can teach that to your children. And that's where you relate the normally unrelated, see potentials and possibilities other people can't see. I can show you how to do that. I can give you all kinds of examples. They chose the right profession for their gifts and skills. And boy, oh boy, is that, a, is that an injustice. 65% of the people are not happy doing what they're doing. That's terrible. Uh, if somebody's not happy doing what they're doing, what you, you owe them, you owe them to get them out of that. How, how many times have you seen somebody that's uh, in a box and yet they need to sing? I mean, you know, we can just go on and on with a hundred different kinds of illustrations that, that people are not happy doing what they're doing, but they do not have the courage to change. And they don't want to take the risk that's commensurate with it. How many people have you met that you know, you positively know, you, you've met them again and again. You know in your heart of hearts they could make four times more with prepaid legal. And you made a good presentation, a professional presentation, a persuasive presentation, a convincing presentation. But their low self-image is helping them hang on to that. They're, they're clinging to it because they, they, have, they don't have any self-esteem, their, their self-confidence, uh, and you can't shake them loose from it. And it's really sad, isn't it? It's really sad. That means you, that, what's the difference? What will make them pull them across the line? Uh, passion. Uh, they'll buy your passion. And I shared that at the National Convention in my talk. 
Factors necessary for financial success depends partially on, because we're all different, the number of years available to reach your financial goals, <clears throat> the focus or concentrated attention you give the task, <clears throat> the amount of desire you have to achieve specific financial goals, and the ability to mesh the financial goals with your value system. <clears throat> they always have to be meshed. Your self-image concerning whether you're entitled to financial success or not. This is a fun part here. Uh, I was reading Homer Rice's book on leadership fitness. I sent one to all of you three weeks ago because I wanted you to have the, before he speaks, to have the same respect for him that I have and see his, uh, with, not, just not knowledge and information, but mainly the book is a book about wisdom and, and, uh, and, and the principles to live a life where you'll have joy. And not many people have joy and peace and contentment and kind of kind of have a whole universal total person feel and a good relationship with everybody, their creator, their spouse, their family, and then it cascades down in their community. Uh, that's, the, that's the kind of man we're gonna be hearing from tomorrow morning. Anyway, here's what he said. If you save a dollar a day on junk food or unnecessary items, soft drinks, from age 18 to 67, you'll have saved $290,000. Now, what does it take to do that? Again, what, when I say you need a plan and you need discipline. Isn't that true? Okay, but if you, if you, if you, spend, the, if you spend a dollar and a half one week, then you won't have that much. For every dollar and a half you spend, it, it, ha, it takes an exponential amount of money off of that 290,000 balance. And so that's what we're, the main thing we wanna talk about today is how do you stick with it? We can come up with a program today, but if you don't stick with it, you're gonna be back to square one again. Example two, if you drive your car t for 10 years instead of three years, you'll save 400000 in a lifetime. That's, same, that's also from less than seven of his book. Uh, that's amazing. Anyway, can anyone make a million dollars? Sure they can. If you save $5 a day, invest it for 40 years, earn 10%, you'll have 998000 So it's no big deal. Uh, you want to make, you want to save, you want to have two, billion, two million? Here's how you get two million. In your 20s, save 5% of your income. In your 30s, save 10%. In your 40s, 15%. In your 50s, 20%. And at age 65, you'll have 2 million instead of 1 million. And anybody can do that with discipline because that fits uh, by, by leaving room for buying a house, leaves room for educating kids and so on. My point is, I don't know who cuts your grass, but they can be a millionaire with very little money if they want to, day in and day out. Put it away and never spend it. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. If, uh, how many of you can take $1,000 and double it? I don't care you do it. You can put it in the bank. Everybody can, can't they? Well, you do it 10 times, you've got a million and 24,000. Now, let's say it takes five years to do it between each increment. That's 50 years, all right? How much money would you have if after, after 25 years? What percentage of the million would you have? 3.2%. Yeah, see here, after, I'm, I'm just put the, the 10 years there. I did that because I don't know how many lo how long it would take you to do it. I know people that make a year on their money. So, uh, but anybody can double it. I'm just saying double it 10 times and you've got yourself a million and $24,000. It's not, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. If, this is the preponderance of people. If, if we're not wealthy and we're not saving money and we're not becoming financially independent and we're not earning a great deal of money, what's holding us back? And it, it's the negative conditioning that we receive from our past and that we've been conditioned by our parents, our teachers, our neighbors, our relatives, our religion, the era in which we were born, our siblings, friends, and the list goes on and on and on. But there is any doubt about it, any way you cut it, we're conditioned people. Are you limited by ideas like these? Don't be too ambitious. Wealth is for people who want to step on someone else. No matter how hard you try, you'll never get ahead. Uh, don't try to keep up with the Jonas. Our family's always been poor, but they're honest. Poor self-image is the main, main reason. I went over, I go and speak in all the schools in Waco to all the kids to get, to get them to stay off of drugs. And, uh, and I tell them, and I, dri I do drive, I borrow my wife's car. She drives a Jaguar. I do, I do take my wife's car and go over there 
And I said, I want you to look out the window and look at my car. These are kids in the sixth grade, okay? And they're, uh, well, it'll be 65, in our town, 65% black, about 25% Hispanic, and about 10% white. And I said, I've got, I drive a Jaguar and I, don't, and I don't deal in drugs. And I said, here's the deal I'll make with you. If you girls will not get pregnant and you guys will stay off the drugs and keep your nose clean, uh, I'm gonna hand you on the platter a four-year college education. And here's the difference in your income. And I put it on the board. This is what you'll make if you don't go to school. You'll never see the ocean. You'll never own a car. You'll live on welfare. You'll live government subsidization. Then I go over to the next column and say, if you just get through high school, you'll, gar you'll have a car, it'll be 15 years old, and you may be able to have a, uh, an apartment that you pay the rent instead of it being government subsidized. And about every five years, you can see the ocean, and you may go to a movie once a month. And then I go over to the next one and show them with two years of college, and then four years of college, and what you can do. And we're going to all work about 50 years. I don't like school any more than they do. I never did like school. And I know most of them, you know, say, do you like school? No, 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 I don't, like, I don't like school either. But only a fool wouldn't work. Why wouldn't you work this short length of time here, four years of college or include high school, and then be able to make three to 20 times as much income all your life? And that's when I sell them. Now, you ready for this? I have gone to their homes individually, one at a time. And I've had the parents chase me off and said, we, we've always been poor, and you're filling stupid dreams in our kids' heads. Nothing, nothing like that can ever happen. Well, what are, what are they telling me? They're projecting their low self-image onto their children, who, who projected onto their children, who projected onto their children. Uh, I have a housekeeper, and uh, she's taking care of her three grandchildren. And uh, she's accepted responsibility to make sure that they get through school, make sure they get an education. I've helped provide them cars when they're going to college, uh, help them study. And all I've done was help them with their self-image. Well, one of them's the first, uh, starting quarterback at Arkansas this year. And uh, I mean, that's pretty exciting to me. And he's going to be obviously in the NFL. But, but I, I, I think. I think what we need to do is co convince ourselves first by being a role model to everybody of what can happen and what, what you can do. Uh, there, there, isn't anything, there isn't anything that should hold any, anyone back, no one. If they've got two, two, two eyes, above average intelligence, if they have an IQ of 100, 110 or better, and they can hear and they've got two arms and two legs, they can, they can have the American dream. Self-image and making money. I've never seen anyone achieve highly or earn a large income with a low self-image. And boy, that's what I did for a living. I've been in the self-improvement business for over 50 years. And the, the, the big stumbling block with everybody all along the way. I've gone in and sold companies, our goals programs, taking 100000 a quarter of a million dollars worth of money out of a company. And, and you know who uses the goals programs and works on them and completes them and lives them? 3% of the people. And about 10% more write it all down. They're there with you. They're right there in the classroom. And they've even got a prettier plan of action than the other people. They're just the top 3% do something about it. They take action. They have, they have initiative and self-reliance. They're willing to take a risk. People who consider themselves failures fail. <laughs> <laughs> and the rich get rich, the poor get poor, the poor. That's nonsense. And we don't, we, don't, we don't talk enough in our homes, we don't talk enough in our schools, we don't talk enough in our churches about discipline and self-reliance and accepting personal responsibility for your life. It is people who are goal-directed with a strong self-image and a desire to get richer. That's who has wealth. Those with no goals and direction or low self-image are incapable of becoming successfully... Fine. Now, I'm talking about even if they have a I'm talking about even if they have a high IQ or have enormous gifts and talents, they're not going to do it. It's like the guy that was going to paint the Madonna, and he's, and he's, uh, he, and he's uh, collected all of his life, and he w went, tried to go to the right city, and then he tried to find the right model. And then he wanted, wanted to get the lighting right, and somebody said, how's it coming? He said, well, I've gotten just about there. Well, one day they found him dead, and, and they buried his ma masterpiece with him. He never painted it. Well, you got a song to sing, and you got a masterpiece to paint, and you got a life to live, and you got a 10,000 lives you can change. 
But it has to start with action. It has to start with you taking your paintbrush and taking a risk. I've made tens of thousands of sales presentations. We talk about car reluctance, tens of thousands of sales presentations. And you know what happened? Only one person injured me. Or they're not gonna, they're gonna hit you, if, if you press and press and press. I'm deaf, I don't know what the word no takes. If somebody said no, I've told you three times, I'm not interested in buying. I said, well then help me out with my presentation then. Let me start over here and give me some suggestions, will you? Um, you know, if they said I sell, they don't have the chance of a dying duck in a hailstorm. Now what is that? That's an attitude. And if I walk in any place, anywhere, I visualize a red carpet rolled out and two trumpeters at the door and whoever's behind that door has been waiting for me all their life. They want to do business with me and they want to be my friend. <laughs> okay, let's talk about, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with this next one. I'm going, this is the IR theory. Can you put that up? Yeah. This is your identity and roles. Uh, the identity is who you are at the core, your self-image, uh, your values, and your roles are the roles you play in life. And this is a four-hour seminar by itself. So instead, I'm going to, I'm going to hand you out. Do we have those to hand out? Yeah. Okay, we're going to hand you out this section where you can uh, read it and study it. I want you to I want you to get it down pat. If you can if you can educate your sales staff with this, listen to this close. I will guarantee it'll it'll cut your turnover in half. It'll cut your turnover, and if you can teach your kids this, it'll save them more misery than they're going to have in their whole lifetime. Let's say in in your identity from one to a ten. Are you, a, are you a four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10? In the roles we play in life, uh, we can mess up on a job or a career. And, and like, let's take, for, a, for example, if they hand out a critique sheet here and rate my presentation today, I'll, some of you will give me a two, and some of you give me a four, some of you give me a 10. I take those and look at them. I don't take it personal. And I will, I will improve my capacity and my ability to be able to make a presentation next time. You understand what I'm saying? But in my identity, I came here in here in I-10, and I'm going to leave in I-10, and I really don't care what you think about that. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what you have to do when you go in to make a presentation. Now, what do our salespeople do? They do not do that because of they have a low self-image, and it's called call reluctance. And call reluctance is because we're afraid people are going to strike back what hurts us most. That's our desire to be liked. Loved, wanted, appreciated, and accepted. So, so to keep from that happening, we shuffle papers, stay in the office, say we're making calls, going to get our car fixed, and not making the, not doing the activity. Harlan Stonecipher is 100% correct when he said you have to have the activity. And like it or not, this is a numbers business. You have to make so many calls to make so many presentations to make so many sales. And you do it's you have a sales presentation to sell a membership. You have a sales presentation which, you know, I call the moment of truth to get your residual income at the convention. Well, it's the same identical thing. And if you learn this IR theory and teach it to your salespeople, uh, it'll be one of the best things you can do. So there, I did four hours and uh, three and a half minutes. Uh, next, uh, managing your money. You have earnings goals, savings goals, investing goals. So why earn, why save, and why invest? That's what we're going to be talking about after lunch. The net of it is everyone has two choices. You play now and pay later, or you pay now and play later. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be one or the other. The most common mistakes people make when they're establishing a budget is failing to pay themselves first, never creating a budget, underestimating expenses, not planning, and that's what the CPA is gonna be talking about in the next session. Money and relationships. In a recent survey, respondents said managing their finances is the biggest strain on their relationship. And these are complaints. Not being able to control partner spending habits. Do any of you have that problem? I uh, Repeated questions about my spending habits are asking you about your spending habits. Partner not sticking to agreed upon budget. Not agreeing on lot. I guess what I'm saying is there uh, 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 Takes two to make a marriage. Takes two to make a business thing go. You got. You have to have an agreement, and and both of them have to stick to it. If one violates it, the other one gets discouraged, and pretty soon the whole thing goes down the tank. Uh, I've got. I have a friend. I'm not going to tell you what state he's in, uh, uh, and he has difficulty 
saving money, he'll save money, and his wife want to go buy a new car with it. He calls me on the telephone. I'm kind of a mentor and a coach to him. And uh, we'll get that resolved. Then, it, then, it's, then it's the next thing. Then he decided he was going to give some money to some economically disadvantaged kids, and his wife said, no, the, we, can't, we, we don't have enough yet built up for ourselves. Well, then, then that, you know what J, J. Paul Getty said when they asked him one time, how much is enough? He said, well, just a little bit more. You know, he was one of the richest people in the world. And the problem is it's never enough. You need to, you need to start the discipline on square one. And here's another survey from USA Today. I just tore this out last week. What people said was the most important, that save money. Establishing goals, paying yourself first, creating a, sticking to a budget. But, but those are all way too low. You know, as far as what's most important. The most important thing is, is uh, the goals, but they should have, they should, they, they should be a whole big, that, that should have been a lot bigger number than it is. And you can't get anywhere if you're going to pay yourself last. You have to pay yourself first. When I sold life insurance, I used stick figures, and I'd draw 10 stick figures on a, on a yellow pad. And I said, now, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the, your rent and everything, why do you pay these? And I said, then where, 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 how much, what do you save? Is this, you save what's left over here? And I said, yes. And I said, well, my purpose to stop by your house today is I want to move you from here up to here. I'm going to put you at the head of the line. And you're going to, you're going to save that 10% first, then you're going to get a budget and make the rest of it last. Then they would even ask me then, well, we, can you stay? As after I sold them a life insurance, would you, would you stay and help me with my finances? I sold the mayor of Miami, for goodness sakes, at 10 o'clock at night. And then he, then he breaks down with his breakdown and said, I'm behind him. I, I've got all these financial problems. He, he bought from me. And I stayed three hours later with a butcher paper in his house and, uh, and, and showed him how to set goals physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, financially, and his family. Short-range goals, long-range goals, tangible goals, intangible goals, what the obstacles and roadblocks, the way around those blocks. We were there until like 3 o'clock in the morning. My point is, when you sell, what did, I, what did that man get when he bought from me? He got a piece of me, didn't he? Okay. I never have cared one iota about a dime I was ever going to make off of anybody. D be glad to do it for free. Uh, I, what I want to do is take the ability I have and help make the world a better place. And if I can change their life, that's what I want to do. And if he buys okay, if he doesn't buy okay. And then how many, just think how many people do you, how many leads do you think that, 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 that guy, how many leads do you think the mayor gave me in the next year? He buried me in them. I couldn't get around to see the people. And the next thing I was going to talk about was credit cards. Uh, they're an open invitation to trouble. Open invitation to trouble. So here's a way, just this is a suggestion for us average salespeople. <clears throat> Separate your needs from your wants and use cash for wants. <clears throat> that way you can't overspend. And use credit cards for nothing, basically. I don't use them for anything except you have to give them when you check in a hotel. And I don't know, do you know when you say, I'm going to pay you cash when I leave? The minute you leave the desk, they go ahead and charge that hotel to your credit account and then credit it back when you pay them the cash. They got their money right on the dime with you, and they don't tell you that. Interesting, isn't it? If you're going to use credit cards, you need to pay them the day you get the bill. <clears throat> Along that line, as far as paying bills, let me just say what we do a lot of times in our, in our operation is we pay bills the day we get them, and if it has to do with any ma ma materials that usually uh, where you have a month to pay, we go ahead and take a 2% discount, even though it says you can, doesn't say you can, and they fuss back, and then you split the difference with them. You've made just 1%. Do that 12 times a year, and you're making 12% on your money. I'm just saying uh, everything's negotiable. My wife doesn't like to shop with me in department stores because I always go from the salesman to see the manager, and um, and I want to negotiate. I want to negotiate buying a couch, because I said, well, think about it. It's not logical. If you tell me I don't have to pay any interest for uh, two years, I don't have to pay payments two years, and the couch is five hundred dollars, and I give you five hundred dollars, you got the use of my money free for two years. So I want to back and discount that, <clears throat> and I want to get the couch for four hundred dollars cash. <clears throat> Well, I've, I've had many of them tell me we can't do that because he, he's only been, he's in a box. He's been taught one way to do it. And then, uh, 
I said, well, obviously you don't own this business. Because <laughs> if he owned the business, he'd taken a New York minute. Back to the credit card things. The next is, do you think you need more stuff? Because we get sold stuff. I told you this morning, 80% of the money you spend is for stuff. It's for wants. It's not for needs. So what do you do? Just simplify. And here's what you ask. Is it a need or a want? Research states, I said 80%. The research says 90% of the time it's a want. Simply put it back on the shelf. You don't need it. I'm lucky. I'm married to the greatest woman in the world in all areas of life, physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, financially, family. Let's talk about finance. She'll, I'll give her $500, she goes to Dallas to shop, comes back and gives me back the $500. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> What'd you say? The old training program. The old training program, yeah. Right? I said, well, didn't you find anything? No, she said, I didn't see anything I wanted. I didn't see anything I wanted. So she's very careful and very thrifty. And now she has a, an income of her own. I did notice this, that she puts all of hers in savings, and then everything we do is spent out of mine. <laughs> now, so I almost just fell out of my tree one time. I was in her dressing area, and I saw her checkbook open. It had $63,000 in her checking account. And I, I said, well, the boys' club needs uh, $10,000. Uh, I don't have any ready cash right now. Can, can you, would you mind, you know, God's obviously treated you real good. Would you like mind giving $10,000 to the Boy Scouts? Well, I got $10,000 out, out of that checking account. Well, let me tell you what was wrong with that. I've never seen that checkbook again. <laughs> and I don't know where she's hiding it. <laughs> Data from personal financial consultants. This is what they say. These are, these are people who make their living as financial consultants, personal financial consultants. Uh, put 20% in savings, 30% for wants, and 50% for needs. I thought that wants thing was a little high, but I think the reason they came up with that number is because they're being realistic with, with, the, with the human race in, in North America. So if you, ever, you need to know where your paycheck goes. And there's a lot of forms that you have that are in that book as far as you're filling out your budget. You need to fill that out and be honest because it's, it's for you, for your planning, and you'll find that you're spending more money across the board on almost everything than you think you are. And I, I'd say as a basis, you, this thing's not gonna work at all. This dog won't hunt, not two seconds, if you don't have a budget. Another thing I just wanna say on myself here, this is, there's a lot of ax axioms that we've been handed down by our parents. You know, you gotta watch your pennies. See, that's junk. I give all my pennies. I give all my pennies away, or give them to my grandkids. I'll tell you what I watch. I watch the dollars, and I watch the big ones, and I look for for big chunks I can save, and that's where I, that's where you make a lot of money, not the pennies. It's watching the dollars. <laughs>